Hey, everybody. So first of all, this is really cool because I don't often get to speak in my own backyard. The last lecture I gave, I was in the Philippines, so this is a lot better. And, um, and a nice, intimate audience. I like this. This is really cool. I guess the last guy that you had was Jim Jackson. Were you guys here for the Jim Jackson lecture? Don't listen to anything he said. <laughs> but no, he, we were great friends. And uh, we got a lot of history along with Jonathan and a few other people. I can't see. But um, uh, so are, all you guys are gaming. Is that right? No. So that's wrong. So... <laughs> So there's gaming, there's, uh, what are some of the disciplines that you guys do? Just blurt them out. Character animation. Character animation. Cool, cool. Well, story, uh, I'm going to talk about creating stories for animated films. <clears throat> I'm going to walk back and forth, too. Uh, I'm going to talk about stor creating stories for animated films, but that... It really is a big umbrella, creating stories, talking about stories. And the thing that I'm going to talk about today, which is kind of story structure and some of the things that I think about, it's a little bit analytical, but I think it's really important um, to help you guys, to, you know, depending on where you might go. You know, one of the things I, I have another lecture that I do, I was telling Jonathan, called uh, Persistence of Vision, which is, or I talk about my career and this persistence of having this vision of where you want to go. And the big thing I talk about is where, you know, when I was your age, when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, I had this really clear idea of what I wanted to be as an artist, which was a wildlife artist, which is completely different than what I ended up doing. And I went in all these different directions. And so the reason I'm bringing that up is because, you know, story, no matter where you end up in the entertainment industry, story is really part of all of it. You know, it's, it's part of our daily lives. And uh, for the for the industry that you guys are in, for that that we're all in, you know, the, the basis of all of it is story. Um, whether it's image creation, you know, each image should tell a story. Whether it's a narrative that you're trying to tell, all of it is story. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Um, I'll talk. I just want to talk about my career just a little bit, just to to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. And actually, I'll back up even further from that because I, I one of the things that I think is important about story. And I tell young people this all the time, is actually living life. If you want to tell a good story, you got, you got to have good experiences. Because someone that doesn't have the experiences, someone who hasn't loved and lost, you know, that cliche, or, or you know, been on adventure, or seen the world, or met other people, and, you know, that, then when you're, write, when you're trying to write a story that involves some of these elements, you're just phoning it in. You're just trying to imagine it. You don't have a, a well to pull from you know, in order to, to make those experiences real when you, when you start to write them out. And so, you know, I started out, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a, 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 an animal artist. From the time I was five years old, you know, I used to sit with my father in the, in the garage when he was carving decoys. And I'd sit there and draw ducks and geese and all kinds of stuff. And, and, uh, and then my parents split up when I was young, and I ended up moving to Florida, and we lived out in the swamps down in, uh, uh, in the Everglades, near uh, north of right near Immokalee, outside of Naples. We lived in this little trailer, and I used to run around out in the woods out there, and I used to chase animals and draw them. I used to collect roadkill and bring it home and draw them. <laughs> I was a weird little kid. But I, they were really cool experiences. And, you know, during that time, I was, you know, I was lost in the Gulf of Mexico for three days when I was 14. And, um, you, know, I've, uh, you know, as I got older, I started traveling the world and, and with my wife, and we went to Africa. I got charged by an elephant while I was there, and just all these different things that have kind of added to my, my life experience. And this, you know, I really want to push this on you guys to get out there as much as you can. Get away from that, that electric screen as much as you can and experience life. So, you know, I, I wanted to be an animal artist. I ended up going to Ringling College of Art and Design. And uh, I joined the, uh, I, I got into the uh, uh, illustration major department, and I wanted to work for National Geographic. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do all the really cool, you know, fold-out spreads that you saw and that I grew up with. I had stacks and stacks and stacks of National Geographic magazines in our little trailer in my room. I had to kind of walk around them to get to my bed. And then, oh, that was another thing. Our house burnt down, and and at one point we had a forest fire come through, and we had. And we had no insurance, so I was actually homeless when I was 17. And all these, you know, so that's another experience that added to 
you know, some of these, some of the writing that we did later on. But, um, but while I was at Ringling, I found out that, that uh, uh, National Geographic didn't have on staff illustrators. And I was really, I, I freelanced my way through school because I didn't, I didn't have any money to go to school, so I kind of paid as I went. And I didn't want to freelance anymore. I wanted to be on staff. And so when I found that out, I didn't know what I wanted to do anymore. And so I found out there was two companies that were coming to Ringling. One was Hallmark Cards, and the other one was Disney. And Disney just happened to be first. And so I put together a portfolio of figure drawings and animal drawings and thought, hey, maybe I'll, I'll be a, a background painter. Or I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I thought, hey, at least I can, I can be on staff somewhere. And I th I'd never thought about animation other than I think I saw uh, uh, Robin Hood when I was a little kid, but I hadn't really seen any Disney films. I liked animation. But anyway, I put, I put together a portfolio and it was accepted and I got into an internship. And then I was, um, I was lucky because when I, the internship was in Los Angeles and I was brought out to Los Angeles to, to get trained in animation. I was an illustrator, but they wanted to see if they could teach an, uh, animation to people that could draw. And so I was lucky enough to be teamed up with a guy named Glenn Keane. Yeah, so, so you guys know who Glenn Keane is, or most of you do. Glenn Keane, if you don't know who Glenn Keane is, he's pro probably one of the top contemporary animators in the world in the last 30 or 40 years. And, um, and lucky for me, I didn't know who he was because I didn't know anything about animation. So I wasn't, he was just a guy that could draw really good, you know? And so it was great. So I went into his office every day and Glenn, not only is he a great animator, he's a, he's a wonderful human being. And every lecture that I give, I always talk about him. He chokes me up actually, because he, he gave me so many chances. And because uh, I was just this little kid that, you know, I really didn't have a lot of direction. And he he lit this fire in me, uh, you know, with animation. He showed me I took, you know, this this burning desire of wanting to draw animals and, and the world and that sort of thing. And then he showed me, well, I can you can do that, but then you can bring it to life and you can bring music and you can bring acting and you can do all these different things and encompass it all into animation. And it was, you know, it was a world that I, I didn't even know existed. And so he really hooked me. And luckily for me, I ended up getting a job at the end of my internship, and that's what started this career. So that was my, that's my long intro of kind of how I ended up at Disney. I was with Disney for 21 years, uh, right up through, uh, well, actually a little while after Brother Bear. Um, and uh, we, our studio uh, in Orlando was shut down in 2004, 2003. We had a great studio there, and um, and I ended up uh, I stayed with Disney. Ended up transferring out to Los Angeles. But while I you know while I was there, I was out there for six years. My wife passed away uh, from cancer, and so that's when I decided to quit Disney because I kind of lost my way after that happened. And so that's the reason I left Disney. I was there for 21 years, and then came back to Florida, and. Um, and kind of, I, I worked for Digital Domain. I was doing some movies for them until they went uh, south. Uh, we were literally, we were down south, and then the company went south. So they went bankrupt. And so since then, I've kind of decided to go out on my own. And over the last several years, I've been doing what I'm doing now: uh, teaching courses, talking to people, doing my own films, and, and having a ball doing it. But while I was at at Disney, I worked on all of these films. So I worked on Rescuers Down Under. That was my first feature to actually animate on. That was a fun movie. And then the next one was Beauty and the Beast. And that, that was a huge break for me because Glenn, I was, you know, before Rescuers Down Under, we worked on a, a, a Roger Rabbit short uh, called uh, Tummy Trouble. No, not Tummy Trouble, Roller Coaster Rabbit. And it was, it was, first, it was the first thing we animated in Orlando. And... Uh, um, and that's where I became an animal. I was animator. I was promoted to animator, and so this was the first feature I worked on. And then when we went into Beauty and the Beast, uh, Glenn came back and said, "Hey, I need somebody in in Florida to animate the Beast to represent, you know, that character there." And because uh, Mark Hen, who was another animator, was doing Belle, and so we needed to kind of work with each other. And so he asked me to do that. And so that was our first time getting back together. And the reason I was talking about earlier how Glenn had given me so many breaks. This was a huge character because Glenn was doing the Beast. And so I, I, I was 21 or 22, I was 22, 20, 
two, I think so, yeah. And so for a 22-year-old, that was a big break. And so I got to, you know, animate some really great stuff. There's a scene in, in um, there's a scene in the film where he's getting bandaged, where Bell's trying to bandage him after the wolf fight, if you guys are familiar with the film. And they start yelling back and forth. I, I animated that sequence. <clears throat> and it was it was a it was such a huge learning experience. And Glenn really Glenn had this ability, has this ability to take young people, young animators, young artists, and take them, you know, they might be here, and he elevates them to here. And it, and it's consistent. I've seen him do it, you know, with everybody. And that's what he did with me. And so I, I did things that I never thought I could do. And what was great is that it enabled me, the work that I did on Beauty and the Beast. Um, and that Glenn gave me, because he's super generous too, um, when it came time to do Aladdin, I was given my, my first character to, to supervise. And so that was Raja the Tiger. Because I was also still kind of known as the animal guy at the studio. I still held on to all that stuff. And so I got to design and animate Raja uh, and also animated Jasmine. And then out of that, The Lion King came along. And uh, you know every film was a step up you know, career-wise from the last. And so in Lion King, I, I was able to do Nala, young Nala. Uh, and so once again, Mark Henn, who did Simba, I did Nala, and we did our scenes together, and it was a lot of fun, and, and it grew. And then I was back again with Glenn on Pocahontas, and I animated Pocahontas with him. And then on Mulan, uh, I had several characters. I was originally supposed to do this character called Bao Gung, and he was the villain. And then he got written out of the story, and so I ended up with like several small characters. I got uh, Yao, who's the guy that fights all the time, and then all the ancestral ghosts that come alive in the backyard. And so that was that was really cool. And then right after that, um, right after the right after we wrapped on Mulan, uh, we we did a. Um, kind of a state of the union uh, for, for the animation studio where we had several of our satellite studios linked up and our, the heads of our studio would get up and talk and talk about what's going on. And one of the things they talked about was this film called Bears that was in development. And so I perked up when I heard Bears because I had just gotten back from Alaska and, and a painting trip up there and you know really wanted to animate Bears or maybe art direct something like that. So I started, con and there, but there was nobody working on the story at the time. It was just in development. So I... I jumped over and, and um, started talking to the heads of the studio, and, and because of the, thing, the different things that I had done on these other films, they gave me the opportunity to actually direct the, the movie. And so that's another long-winded way of getting to, when I, got, when I accepted the job to direct Brother Bear, I thought, well, I've done all these different you know, films, I've worked on all these other films, I know how they're put together, I should know how to, how to, how to make an animated movie. And, uh, and I didn't know what I didn't know. And the biggest thing I didn't know at the time, I kind of knew it, but I didn't know it, which is story is number one. I had no idea how to tell a story, at least not from a filmic standpoint, the structure and how a story is built and how characters are interweaved and all that sort of thing. Once again, a lot of people will think, well, you know, I go and watch movies. I, I've made movies. You know, I've been a part of the crew at least. But there's so much more to it. And so that's what I want to talk about. So story is number one. The one, one of the things I like to talk about with story as an example is that it is, it's the only element of the film process that can stand on its own. Meaning, I can get up, which I'm going to do later on, I can get up and I can tell you a story. And if I tell it well, I can make you laugh, I can make you cry, I can have you do all of that. It's the only part that I can, where I'm just verbally telling you that the story can stand on its own. You know, the, the visuals, they, they, the sound, the music, they all need to work together. But story, you can just tell a story and you can get the idea across. And that's, it's, it's important. And it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard to make, to, to, you know, it's one thing to make, a, to, to tell a story. It's another thing to, get all the intricacies and the complexity and everything else to work right. One of the things I like to equate it to is why I have a Rubik's Cube up there is, you know, a lot of times, you know, this, this or that will be working in the story, but let's say this character isn't working right or this plot point isn't quite right. And so we'll go in and we'll, we'll shift it and, and rewrite it and make it, make it work. 
but just like a Rubik's cube, you get that side working, and you just screwed up all the other three sides, you know. That, you know, so it it just takes a lot of work getting all the facets to to come together. <clears throat> as far as making animated movies, you you can talk to any any story artist, any head of story, any director. And by and large, everybody has a slightly different process. Now, some of the things I'm going to talk about are going to be universal, but we all have a different process. But this, the, the one that I'm going to talk about today, that's what works for me. And it's not meant to be in concrete, but this is what works for me. This is what works for my partners that I worked with. Uh, Bob Walker was my directing partner, and Chuck Williams was the producer uh, for all the different projects that we worked on. And so this is a process that we kind of developed for ourselves. So one of the things that I always, when I, when I give this lecture, I always talk about how unique the animation process is because, and this is one of the mistakes I actually see, and I'm going to, I'll just go out on a limb and say it, because I, I, I look at Blue Sky, and I look at, uh, which is Fox, and I look at uh, Warner Brothers, who's also doing some animation, and uh, Sony as well. And I've, I've worked with those studios intimately, and one of the things that I think is a mistake um, that they're doing is that they're hanging on to the live-action process of filmmaking, which is they write a script, write a script, write a script, keep iterating on that script, and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite until that script is perfect, and then they make the script. And the reason that's wrong is because so often, especially in animation, you get that script storyboarded, and then you realize, oh my gosh, it worked on the page, but it doesn't work up here. And that's one of the beauties of our process. The meat of the story, <clears throat> and, and ed it's all put together in editorial, is, all, is, is in pre-production. We, we, make, we make the story, we iterate in the story, all in pre-production. And it's one, I'll, I'll jump ahead here. So what that means is we, we iterate in the medium. So what, that's a, once again, it's another way of saying we write the script, and we try to get the script as tight as we can, but there's a balance. And so what we like to do is try to get it up on the screen as quickly as possible because it's going to be wrong. It's just always, it always is. No matter how much work you put into that script, it's going to be wrong. Something's going to be wrong in that movie. And so we like to get it up fast, be wrong fast, so we can make our corrections and get a good movie. So that's what I just said. <laughs> so it's get that script and then get the story up on, on, on reels. And one of the things, it's, I liken it to doing a dress, dress rehearsal for a play. That's, what, that's the closest thing. Rather than making full-length you know, live-action films, when you storyboard a movie and you get to watch it, you're you're watching a dress rehearsal, right? You're you're getting to see how you know, and you're not seeing all the animation and everything, but you're seeing that story play out with dialogue. We cut dialogue, we cut music, we cut everything to it to make sure it's working. And you get to see it in the medium and see if it's actually going to work. And so, if you got a joke that's supposed to get a laugh and you don't get a laugh, okay, good. You can go and you can go back and you can you have the opportunity to rewrite it. So this is why, if you look at some of the top films, if you, if you, every year, you know, at the end of the year, you can look at a list of the top 10, top 20 films. There's usually about nine or 10 in there that are animated. Now keep in mind, there's only about 17 on average full length animated features that are widely released. So that's a really good average for them to be in that top 20 to get that many out of the thousands of live action films that are made. Most live action films are bad. If you average everything out, most of them are bad. And it's just a handful that are actually really great, that, that get the accolades that they deserve. But animation has that advantage. We have that ability to sit down and play it all out in storyboards and watch it and see if it works or not. So this is how we start. One of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, when I was working uh, at Digital Domain uh, just a few years ago before they uh, went under, I was hired to uh, head up the studio from a creative standpoint along with my partner Chuck Williams, and we were going to uh, develop several films, and then out of that we were going to uh, pick one to go into production and 
get that the whole process of the studio making movies. So the, uh, we developed four films, and uh, we got them all up to three act structures. And so we had a you know kind of a, a a little coming together and decided what movie we wanted to make first. And Tembo, the Legend of Tembo, was this uh, elephant story that we came up with that we wanted to do first. And so this this we ended up I guess working on it for. I don't know, two and a half years, I think, we got into it. Uh, we were $13 million into the spend on it. We were, just about, uh, we were just about to go into production, and the studio went bankrupt. Not because of our $13 million, but, <laughs> it, but it, the studio went bankrupt. And so we didn't get to make it. And out of the bankruptcy, the movie was bought by a Chinese company called Galloping Horse. Uh, they are a distribution company out of Beijing. And they, they took the story, and they, it's sitting in a box in Beijing, um, and it's never going to be made. So I'm going to tell you that story today, so you get to see it. I want to use that as an example, because it's something that you, nobody here has seen, and so I can pitch it to you fresh. So think of Tembo as Bambi meets Gladiator. Okay, that's, that's Tembo in a nutshell. Tembo is a sweet, beautiful little elephant that's taken from the plains of Africa. It happens during the time of Alexander and, and uh, 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 you know, when, when elephants were, you know, used, they were the first tanks, you know, they had battle elephants and that sort of thing. So he's, he's a sweet little Bambi-esque elephant that is taken from the plains of Africa and brought it overseas to, to be raised and fight in the battles overseas. And it's his story of how he overcomes that and returns home. So, I want to tell you the process of how we got there. So when we start, when we get together and we start coming up with a notion for an animated movie, um, the the ideas really can come from anywhere. We we talk about our personal stories, which is goes back to you know getting out there and living life. Maybe something happened to you in your life that you know you you think can spark into some type of a film idea, dreams, books, songs, um, Brother Bear. Um, it started out, it was a story, it wasn't, it wasn't about brothers when we first started that film. How, how many of you have seen Brother Bear? Okay, good. So, for those of you that have seen it, that, it used to be about the father and, uh, and son. It was a father and son story. His father was named Chilkoot. And he didn't spend time with his son, and so, Kenai. And Kenai went on this rampage, and it started the whole story rolling. But it was all sparked from Cats in the Cradle, the song Cats in the Cradle where he didn't have enough time for his son. We talked about that song over and over again. And uh, Jim Croce, right? Yeah. And, uh, and it really sparked this idea of, hey, you know, that would be a really interesting movie. And so we ended up writing this whole uh, movie around that, the lyrics of that song. But ultimately, no matter what it is, the, the biggest kiss of death, I think, in any getting any story off the ground is saying, oh man, this is so cool. No one wants to see cool. You'll, cool will be in the movie. It'll be there. But there's no such thing as a seed of an idea being a cool idea. You want an emotional idea. Now that emotional idea can be really cool, but it's got to be emotional first. That's, what, that's why we go to the theater. We want to we wanna have something in us. Be, you know, We want to come out different than the way we walked in. We want to go on a journey. And the only way you can go on that journey is to be moved emotionally. And that's what, you know, that's what animated films do better than any other medium, I think. So the other thing we talk about, and a lot of people don't talk about this, and I think it's a mistake. Penguins, uh, the, the whole, the surfs up and happy feet kind of had this problem somewhat because they kind of came out at the same time. So maybe this, it doesn't overlap, but. We talk about mental real estate, and what that means is, we start when we when we had this elephant story, we started thinking, okay, um, who else who owns elephants? And what I mean by that is, like, if I went to go make, let's, let's say I wanted to make a movie about pirates right now, well, it'd be kind of hard to do that because Disney kind of owns pirates, the Pirates of the Caribbean, or if I had an animated movie about toys that come to life, well, I can't really do that. You know, it's that kind of thing. And even maybe it's, you know, it's, we might have enough history, but even, you know, if I wanted to do something animated with mermaids, well, there's a little mermaid. It's that kind of idea. Are we stepping on any kind of or, or cars? Are we stepping on any kind of mental real estate that might go against us? And so 
what we started talking about was, is there mental, any mental real estate that covers elephants? And so, you know, there was Horton Hears a Who. That was an elephant, but it really, I don't really think they owned elephants at that point. There was Jungle Book that had elephants in it. And there were some live action films, Larger Than Life and Dumbo Drop, but the biggest one obviously was Dumbo. But we, we figured tonally, it was a completely different film. And Dumbo, I think, was done in 1943, I think. I think it was 43. I could be wrong. But we thought there was enough time that had gone by that we could do something fresh. Plus, it was CG, not hand-drawn. So we felt it was good to, to go ahead and, and do it. So what we started doing, we, we do this with every story idea. We started doing spaghetti uh, pitches. And the reason we call them spaghetti pitches is because you throw the idea against the wall and you see what sticks, right? And so we literally would come up, we just start going through our heads, we, we go through our lives, we go through all kinds of different inspirations that we might have for story notions that we could kind of wrap around the subject of elephants. And so we just kind of, we just started doing it, throwing stuff against the wall. And this is some of the stuff that, that stuck. There's actually a lot more, but we boiled everything down. Actually, there was a film uh, that DreamWorks was developing years ago called Tusker. And that film ended up getting canceled at DreamWorks, but the producer that was producing it, she was able to take it and shop it around. And so she had actually come to us and asked us if we wanted to make Tusker. So that was an option. So we had that up on the, on the wall. There's also a, a, a book that I had read called Modoc about a, a, a circus elephant and the kind of the story of his life. And I thought that was really interesting because it's really emotional with the boy. It's a boy that grows up with the elephant. But then we also had our original idea of Tembo. Let's see if I can read this. How we, I can't read it. But it's, it's the idea, it's, uh, you know, a, a young elephant is taken from the African savanna, brought overseas and forced into battle, and, and it's the story of how he overcomes all of that. And so ultimately, we felt like, there it is, Tembo, the epic life story of an elephant captured from the African savanna and forced into fierce training as a battle elephant. We thought, wow, there's some really cool drama in there. There's sweetness in the little elephant. There's, you know... Going into a, a, an, an army atmosphere, there's the ability to create an ensemble of characters and have kind of a stripes kind of comedy, fun kind of stuff mixed in with the drama. So we thought there was a lot of really good opportunity to do something that was totally more in line with, say, Lion King. You know, if, if when you think about Lion King, it's a big dramatic film, but there's a lot of fun in there, you know. And so that was kind of the idea that we had that we wanted to to approach. So this is how we we got into starting to develop the story. The, st the first step, and I don't know if you guys get this drilled into your heads, but <clears throat> you can't research enough. Once you start, the first thing you do, I'm doing it right now, I'm doing a short film uh, called Snow Bear, and it's about a polar bear who's alone in the Arctic, and he creates this bear made out of snow to keep himself company. It's a super simple story premise, and it's only a six-minute film, and... I've been researching the Arctic and polar bears, even though I know about polar bears as well. I've been researching it for the last month and a half, making sure I have all the information I need. Um, yeah, so when you, when you think you've got enough, go out there and do some more, because you never know what you're going to find. And one of the things we do uh, is we start with what we know. And what I mean by that is with elephants, for instance. What do we know about elephants? Well, most people know that there's several different species. There's African elephants, there's Indian elephants. Most people know that they're beasts of burden. They've been used for beasts of burden. Um, not everybody knows, but they are, they're used as tanks. Uh, they look cool in the water. Have you ever seen co commercials or video of elephants swimming? We really wanted to see that in, in our story. We just wanted to find a way to do it. But, you know, the classic phrase, an elephant never forgets. That's a really cool idea to throw into the, into the telling of the story. There's elephant graveyards. Elephants are one of the few animals that actually cry. Um, elephants at the circus. There's dumb, you know, some of the other things that we, you know, Dumbo and Dumbo Drop. These are things that we knew we wanted to avoid. So we start listing these things that, that we know that we think are in the common psyche of the public. And then the in-depth research starts. And that's where, you know, if it's, if it's just myself, and my partner Chuck, we would go off and we would just we'd order every book we could find. We'd go to the zoo. I would I would be out there drawing, 
but it's it's reading, 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 drawing, 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 reading. It's it's trying to fill my our brains with as much information as we can that will ultimately eke its way into the story. And then what we do, like I said, if, so if it was just Chuck and I, we go and do that. But a lot of times we have our writer, we might have a few story people involved, and everybody goes off and does their research. And then we get back together and we talk about what we've discovered. We, and then out of that discovery, people say, you know what? There's this really interesting emotional thing that elephants do that I think might be kind of cool if we put it in the story and it could work its way in this way. And it starts, it starts a conversation going. And so now that, that one or two line premise that we had thrown against the wall that stuck, now it starts to develop and it starts to turn into something more. And so this is where the, the, you know, you've always heard about development, story development. This is how the story develops. So out of this, that story begins to emerge. It, get, it begins to get legs. It begins to get some weight to it. It begins to get some emotion. And this is where we, we start to get really excited. Out of this, the characters also start to develop. Okay? And as they... this is One of the cool things, you know, so many people ask me, well, is, is your story character-driven or is it plot-driven? Well, there, to me, there's no such thing as one or the other. They, they, work, they work together. And so as you develop that plot, as you create out of your research, as, as you come up with new ideas, that plot is going gonna, is gonna to dictate what kind of character that you need in order to tell the story in the best way possible. And so, and then as that character develops, you'll start focusing on developing that character, and then you're going to discover traits that character starts becoming real. And then that character starts to dictate the plot. And all of a sudden, you start finding that you're going back and forth in the story development, and it starts to grow, it starts to mushroom. So we talk about, you know, what, what's their life about? What, what do they want? Who's trying to stop them? You know, these are some of the plot devices that we talk about. What's, what are the conflicts that they're facing in the story? You know, there's internal conflict. What are they trying to get over in order to achieve their goal? And then there's the external conflict. There's the plot. There's the, that's the A story. The B story is that internal thing that's going on. And those two things are usually really intertwined. Meaning, or at, for example, in Tembo, Tembo is, he's this little elephant that wouldn't hurt a bug. He literally likes to go out and collect bugs. He's just a sweetheart. But in his world, in the elephant world, in, the, in the, the herd of the elephant, the males, the way they show their dominance, the way they get by, is they fight. You know, and the, and the top dog is the top dog. And so that's their value system. And so here, you've got a character that has this conflict inside of, you know, he doesn't want to fight. He's, this, he's a sweetheart. Now, what's the worst thing that can happen to him? He gets kidnapped and brought into an army to become a battle elephant. So there's the conflict. So those are some of the things that kind of emerge as you start to develop the story. <clears throat> we also, you know, like we, we came up with the ensemble. We came up with a whole bunch of a cast of characters. Um, and then we also come up with actor types as we as we start to pitch the story, as we start to develop our characters, we'll start to identify them, especially when you're just vomiting words out like I'm doing now, That's those are the only pictures you have, then we'll say, okay, uh, think Dustin Hoffman, you know, and then and that, you know, at least that gets a picture of a type that you can, you can then pitch. And then we start doing drawings. So as the plot and characters develop, they begin to inform each, inform each other. So I got a little bit ahead of myself, but that's, that's kind of what happens. As, you know, one starts to inform the other and you start kind of sloshing back and forth. So while this is happening, you know, that's the fun part of being animators and coming from an animation background. We're not just sitting there writing. We're sitting there writing and we're drawing and we're doing caricatures of each other. But we're also, we're drawing, we're drawing our characters. We're coming up with moments. We're, 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 it, it, the, visually, it's starting to develop, to develop as well. And often, you might hit a drawing that, where the writer will go, oh my god, I didn't think of it that way. And all of a sudden, the story starts to shift. Or you might get some kind of detail, some kind of character trait that wouldn't have made it in had you not drawn something. And so sometimes they're just stupid little, you know, Tembo being the, the battle elephant. <laughs> you know, sometimes they're goofy little drawings, but, you know, we're always, we're, you know, sometimes they're just 
scribbly little thumbnails, an idea for a shot. But we're constantly just sketching and drawing and, and trying to come up with new ideas. But then out of that, um, quite often, I'm a little bit different than a lot of the animation directors because I did come from a painting background and that sort of thing. So I, in the beginning, I like to kind of hog. <laughs> I like to hog some of the, the opportunities to go off and create characters. I'll kind of go off and do it myself. I'll do it on the weekends. And so as the story develops, I'll go off and start doing some initial character designs. And so I'll go off and do some of these renders. And so these are images that I did as we created some different story points and some character um, traits, I would go off and, and, uh, and write. And then out of that, we would start our uh, paint. And out of that, we'd start cr uh, creating character boards. Keep in mind, this is all happening while we're also writing and developing the story. But these character boards, we start putting them together. We, you know, it's an animation studio. So we want to see, we want to see visuals. That's, that's what ultimately, that's what's inspiring to us. And so we'll start putting up pictures of our characters. We start putting up some of our actor types. Here, you know, there's a character, uh, there's a bird character in the story named Keecha. Now, he won't be part of the pitch. He's a small part of the pitch, but he's actually a big part of the movie. And Keecha is an oxpecker. And oxpeckers are the birds that in Africa that you'll see kind of hanging out on rhinos or hanging out on elephants, and they eat the ticks and all the bugs and all that kind of stuff. Well, Keecha which, by the way, is Swahili for crazy. And actually, you pronounce it Kicha, but I'm putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. So, but, um, but Kicha is this bird, uh, this oxpecker, that when he was still in the nest, uh, he fell out. And so Tembo's mother, being the sweet mother matriarch that she was, um, in passing, picked him up and put, her, put him on her shoulder, and she raised Kicha. As she raised her other her sons, she also raised Kicha. So Kicha grows up thinking he's an elephant. And so Aziz Ansari was a character type that we thought would be really funny. So this is one of the examples of how, you know, just through getting together in the room and talking about plot and talking about characters, and, well, if she's this kind of character, then maybe this happens. And it's just, things just start to blossom. And it really can't happen this is another thing, too. It can't happen between one, you know, unless you're an absolute genius, which there are some out there, but it really needs interaction. It really needs bouncing ideas off of each other. And no holds barred. You know, have to be honest with each other and just, you know, let, let all the ideas fly and don't be afraid because that's where the story really starts to develop. But anyway, so Kicha grows up thinking he's an elephant. Um, and so you'll see, uh, I've got some other character drawings of him. This is actually early. He, um, he's actually really fat because he doesn't fly because elephants don't fly and they eat a lot. And so he, you know, he's just got all these different, and, and the irony of it all of it is, is that he's the best elephant there is. He knows everything there is to be about being an elephant, how to be true to yourself. And so he's a, he's a, he's kind of this representation of what the thematic is going to be. And I, I'll talk about theme in just a minute. So um, not only do well, we, we do character bit boards, but we also start, as the story develops, we'll start to go away and illustrate some of the story moments. And once again, because you're taking it from the written word and representing it with an image, it starts to spark more ideas in other people that weren't quite thinking of it in that way. So I would go away and do some of that. So another big thing... Uh, and once again, you know, going back to this, the notion that I was talking about earlier where this is our process, there's other people that really don't believe in structure. Um, and they just kind of let the story evolve and let it emerge and, and, and they'll start shaping it further down the road. I, personally, I like, I like, I love the, the structure and story structure. I mean, working within, you know, more than just a three act play, which is what 99% of all Western films are, but it's, you know, there's certain things that need to happen within each act. If you kind of, if you made a chart of all the different things that, you know, your opening hook, your inciting incident, all these different things that happen within a story structure of a, of a mil movie, all the way to the end, you know, the midpoint switch and then the all is lost moment, all these different things. If you laid them over all the really good films, 
that have come out, probably 99% of those would fit the structure perfectly. And so keeping, in, keeping structure in mind as we develop our stories really helps us keep it on the path that it needs to go on in order for it to develop in the way that it needs to develop. Another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, making animated movies, I'm just, this is just from, you know, a major studio point of view, making animated movies is, is really expensive. You know, our budget on Tembo was, was going to be, our, our actual production budget was going to be about $85 million with overhead bringing it up to about $120 million. And so you don't want to, you know, that's a lot of money. And so you want to find the most efficient ways of utilizing that money in order to get the, the film made. And so these are, in, in developing the story, these are things that we found that made the process much more efficient. So just like I was talking about earlier, with, all, you know, with structure and all that, every great story has setup and payoff. Um, for instance, you know, Tembo has this trait about how you know he's a lover, not a fighter, right? And that's a setup for something that's going to happen in the third act of the of the, of the film. Um, there's irony in every great story, I think. All of my favorite stories have great irony. And you know, Tembo was another you know, is another one where you know how ironic is it that a kid that just loves peace, wants to be friends with everybody, gets brought out to to become a battle elephant. It's that kind of that kind of thing. Great characters, that goes without saying. Emotion, that goes without saying. But, uh, oh, then there's all, you know, these are some of the things I was talking about earlier about, uh, you know, if you laid out that structure, all the different things that would happen, you know, as you, as you watch the story. There's a great book. There's two great books that I recommend if you guys are interested in story development for features. One is Story by Robert McKee. And then there's another one by, uh, it's called Save the Cat by, I forgot, holy cow. Save the Cat is the name of the book, um, and you'll. And they're both both those books are um, very big on structure. Yeah. Blake Snyder. Yes, thank you, Blake Snyder. Um, Dean Dubois. Do you guys know who Dean Dubois is? He's the director of all the How to Train Your Dragon films and Lilo and Stitch. He was co-director, and um, he's a huge advocate of Blake Snyder and Save the Cat, and that's where I discovered it. Um, and that's what, one of the reasons his films are so good is he's, he's another big, really big structure guy. And I used to pick his brain all the time. So you've got all those things. But the most important part of any story, and I try to nail this as soon as I can, is the theme. Theme to me, theme is, is such, well, it's the most important part. <laughs> it, it's, it's what your movie is about, Okay. And what I mean by that is, I'll tell you what a theme is not. And this is what a lot of people think. A theme is not, oh, it's about love, or it's about loss, or it's about war or divorce, you know, like Kramer versus Kramer. Or uh, Lion King is a coming-of-age story. That's not a theme. That's not, that's not what it's about. That's kind of what it is, and that might be in there, but that's not what the theme is. Those are all subjects. Those are thematic subjects. And so this is where we want to, it's important to know the difference between the thematic subject and the thematic statement, okay? The statement is your theme. The subject is, is kind of the, what, what's in the film. The statement is what it's about, okay? And the, this, to me, is much more important. Because your theme, that thematic statement, is an instruction, Okay, and once again, and I still hear it from a lot of accomplished live action directors, you know, what's your, what, what's, what is this film about? Well, it's, it's about, you know, love and loss and this and that. Well, I, I don't know what that means. But when you can boil your theme down to an instruction, then you can put that into action. And if you can put it into action, then that's something that you can play on the screen, right? And so that's why I, I think it's so important to really, and it makes it, it boils it down to what that particular film is about. Meaning, Tembo, the thematic subject, is war and peace. War versus peace. Well, yeah, but there's a bunch of films that cover that. But if you couple that with being true to yourself, then now it starts to become a little bit more unique and it starts to become, 
when you have when you start mixing the characters in Tembo and some of the ensemble, other uh, ensemble characters, then it starts becoming more unique. And being true to yourself is an instruction, right? So we can we can either go against that, where he's not true to himself and it causes something bad to happen. Or we can go with it, and he finally learns the thematic notion, which usually happens in the climax of the film, and he does that thing he needs to do, and he saves the world. And that's what happens in our story. Another way I explain it is, if you don't know your thematic, you don't know what the film is about. And if you don't know what the film is about, you end up just kind of meandering. It's just You end up with a bunch of things that really don't add up to anything. And so the way I always explain it is the thematic, think of your story as your backyard, and your backyard can go on forever, right? Until you put a fence around it. And so that's what your thematic is. It holds that story together, okay? And you know where the, where, where the boundaries are. You know where, where you can't go beyond, where it starts to become something else. So all that being said, you still need to be prepared to revise because as the story develops, so will the theme. Also, as the story develops, we're gonna, uh, we, we start creating uh, visual boards. We start putting together an act one, two, and three, um, where we start pulling together all of the images that we started uh, uh, drawing, other things that were inspirational. We just start pulling these boards together and start kind of getting a little bit of a visual kind of beat board going for, uh, for what the story's gonna be. And as the story develops even more, we'll break that down and we'll start actually breaking it into scenes and putting the little beats up on the board so we can start to see visually, even if it's in writing, kind of the flow of, of the story. And then, and then we also, this is about the time we do our research trip. And uh, a lot of people argue research trips that they're not necessary. And especially nowadays where, well, you got Google Images, you got the internet, you got all this stuff, there's so much research and experience that you can get off the computer. And, uh, and my answer to that is no. There, yes, there is, but once again, you're not out of the studio. You're not smelling the air. You're not, you know, it's not tactile. And so we did a, a month-long research trip. We went to Kenya. We went to India. We went to northeast India, up near Cambodia. We went to Nepal. We tracked tigers on elephant back in Nepal. From Nepal, we went over to Thailand and went to an elephant festival. And in and, and doing all of that, we kind of we, we got a sense of what Temple would have gone, you know, the journey he would have gone on, and some of the smells and some of the experiences and some of the animals and the landscapes and all the different things that you can't get by looking at a little screen this big. And then usually what we'll do when we come back about this time is we put together an inspiration reel. We've been, at this point, We've been developing the story long enough that we want to now, and usually we want to, we, at some point we got to do a presentation for executives. So we'll usually put this together for our executives to get a sense of what it is that we're making. And also for our crew, for them to get a sense of what we're all making together. Because that's really what, it, what it's all about. It's not me as a director telling, what, you know, telling everyone what to do. It's all of us as a, as a group being inspired and working together to make it. So this was the inspiration reel that we put together for Tembo. Now, keeping in mind, Tembo is, is born in Africa, a sweetheart, taken overseas, and forced into battle. That's the premise. And so that's what we did. That was the premise for putting this together.
So what's really cool about that, <laughs> thanks. But even though, you know, and we just use, I mean, some of them were scribbles, some of them were more rendered, but in, in putting this together, you could really get a sense of the tone, you can get a sense of some of the fun, and you can get a sense of really not knowing the story, you can get a sense of the story. So um, it's one of that one of the first steps of what we do when we're, we're pulling things together and adding music and all that. Um, this is about the time also we start bringing story artists on and we start storyboarding. A lot of times we'll, uh, we'll bring on a couple initially and start doing experimental boarding. Meaning if we don't have a certain sequence that we want boarded to cut together for our reels. Um, one, of the, one of the things I like to do is if I, wanna, if I feel like I want to develop the character a little bit more and I'm not sure where it should go, we'll give that opportunity to one of the story artists and we'll say, okay, here's the situation. And one of the, um, for example, in one, at one point we said, okay, we know Tembo likes to collect bugs. And Tembo gets up one morning and he goes out and he's going out to collect bugs. How would he do that? And we just, that's an open-ended excitement and we just gave it to one of our story artists and he went and boarded it. Well, he ended up coming up with so many cool ideas and, and things. We ended up using about 90% of it in the movie. And so in doing that, there's a lot of fun that can be, it's where the, de the details, the, the emotion, the fun, the character traits, it's where they start to really blossom and come together. And you can't do that without having the story artist. And you'll, you'll notice, I mean, they've, they've, this is uh, one of our guys, Woody Woodman, who would just surround himself with images of elephants and story and everything else. And so, uh, and one of the things we always talk about in the early boarding, uh, you know, when, when we write script, not only do we have to do, do we do the experiment, experimental boarding and have the artist go off and do that, We'll have sequences where we want the characters to, where we want the, the story to be boarded out in a certain way. But we always had the, the rule of beat me there or beat me there, meaning either board what's in the pages or give us something better. And we always had, you know, left the opportunity to the artist to come back and say, hey, I've got this different idea. I think it's going to be better. And so that's how the movie would improve. It's, you know, think of it every step along the way that, that story, the film, everything should get better on the next step. And, you know, one, one of the things that my partner Chuck Williams always talked about is that, you know, we're just, until it, until it gets up on the screen, we're just scientists in the lab. We're just at a chalkboard talking about formulas. It's not until we actually mix the formulas and it blows up in our face or we actually make something do we know if we have a movie or not. So it really, you know, the rubber hits the road when we get it all boarded and put up on the screen. So... Um, this is the other thing, too, that I'm always harping on about story and story artists. And I don't know, are, are, are there some out there that want to be story artists? Good. I'm going to really harp on this to you guys. Story artists, in, in my opinion, if they're not some of the best artists on the film, they should be striving to be. And so you should at least be working towards it. And what I mean by that is that story artists need to know story. They need to know staging from a visual standpoint. They need to know, you know, so there's, there's so many elements that go into, and because staging, there's so many times that I've sat and watched a sequence up on a screen play out that could have been great had the story artist really put some effort into staging or uh, acting. You know, you've got to you've got to know how to. It, it's the first time I say it right up here. It's the first time that the written word goes from the page up onto the screen as an image. That's your responsibility as a story artist. It's the most important responsibility. And so I'm constantly harping that into the into uh, the team because it, it's your first time that you get to see it up there. You know, like I've been talking about. And you do not want it to fail because it wasn't drawn right. Let it fail because the story's bad, but don't let it fail because it was drawn badly. So you got to be striving to make your boards as great as they can be. Uh, and then pitching as a story artist. You know, you're constantly going to be pitching. It's one of the most important aspects of the story process, especially in the beginning, um, because there is nothing else. There's, you know, we don't have any reels at that point, right? The first time that the, a sequence gets boarded, the only way you're going to portray it is to pitch it. And I'm going to pitch you all of Tembo to get you to, to, to as an example. 
Pitches are performances, and you must be honest. I'm just going to read it verbatim. You've got to be honest, meaning you've got to believe it. You've got to feel it. And once again, it goes back to what I was talking about in the beginning. You, you know, it really helps if you've lived it. Now, I'm not obviously a, a little African elephant that was stolen from the savanna, but I've been lonely, you know, and I've been put into positions where I didn't want to be in. I've been in fights, you know, as a kid that I didn't want to be in. You know, there's a lot of life experience that I was able to pull from and insert into the story as I pitched it, as I developed it, as we made it. Which goes to, you got to believe in what you're pitching. You've got, it's it's just as an animator, Glenn Keane would always talk about, you know, you got to feel it and you got to be in it. You know, and that's, it's the same with story. You just, you have to. You've got to convey that emotion. And the only way you can convey that emotion is to feel the emotion. And the only way you can do that is to practice. And so, you know, so often, You'd see on, on like a Friday when story uh, when pitches are due, you'd see all the doors to the story offices shut, and you walk by, and everyone's in there pitching, you know, by themselves and working it all out. So that being said, um, I'm going to pitch you the entire story of Tembo to kind of give you a sense of how you can kind of be brought through this journey. It's a it's a very stripped down kind of bare bones version of the story, but you'll get a sense of character and setup and payoff and thematic and all that kind of stuff. So, a long time ago, on the African savanna, it's think of think of Eden. You know, it's just this beautiful, idyllic, amazing place. And in a rainstorm, this beautiful baby elephant is born. And his name is Tembo. Now Tembo grows into as a little five-year-old, he grows into this the sweetest little boy you've ever met. Once again, think Bambi as an elephant. There's not a mean bone in this elephant's body. Now, little Tembo, little Tembo has two brothers. The first brother is Kicha. Now, Kicha is this oxpecker that fell out of the nest as a little bird, and Tembo's mother raised him. And so Kicha grows up thinking he's an elephant. And because he's an elephant, obviously he doesn't fly, so he's fat, and he eats a lot. But the funny thing about Kicha is that he's the best elephant in the entire herd. He knows more about being an elephant because he's had to work hard to do it. Now, Tembo, on the other uh, opposite end of the spectrum, he's got another brother, a, a, a much older brother named Butu. And Butu kind of represents the opposite of Tembo. Butu is the coolest think James Dean as an elephant, you know. He's even got these rip, this giant ripped ear where he saved a bunch of elephants when he was younger from a, a pride of lions. And so Tembo is seen as the toughest, and those are his values. Anyone that crosses them, he takes them down. But Tembo and Butu are so close. They love each other. Tembo looks up to his brother and, and wants, to, wants him to love him back so badly. And Tembo, or Butu, actually really is a good older brother, and they, they're constantly playing. Well, we catch up to Tembo uh, one morning, and one of the things about Tembo is he is a little boy, and he loves to go out and catch bugs. They call, he calls them his little friends. And he loves to go out and, and collect them, but he has trouble doing it. He keeps scaring them away. So he goes to his mother one morning. He says, Mom, all these bugs keep flying away. Well, I, I can't get them to, to come onto my trunk. And she says, well, Tembo, they're scared of you. He says, scared of me? Why? I don't, I don't want to hurt them. Well, they say, they don't. she says, they don't know. I mean, look how big you are compared to them. He says, I'm not big. To them you are, and you're scary. And she breaks off this little branch, and she gives it to him. And she says, here, try this. And so Tembo takes it, and he heads out, and the first bug he sees, he holds that little branch out with his trunk. And sure enough, a little bug crawls onto it, and then another little bug, and then another little bug, until he's covered. And he's so happy. He just can't believe it. He's got all these little friends, and it's just the coolest thing that's ever happened to him. And so he decides he's going to run off, and he's gonna, he wants to show Butu. He's so proud of himself that he's got all these bugs all over him. So meanwhile, Butu, being the tough guy that he is, he's down at the watering hole, and he's got a bunch of his buddies that are watching, and he picks out the biggest hippo. 
out in the water. And he decides he's going to take this guy on and take him down and kind of be the, the top dog at the watering hole. Well, everybody knows that, you know, a big hippo is the last thing that you want to take on. But Butu's going to do it anyway. And so they square off. The two of them come running at each other. The hippo is going to annihilate them. And then in the last second, you see a little trunk come in, little Tembo, <laughs> with his friend stick. And he holds it up. He, and he's trying to, you know, he wants to, to diffuse the situation. And he holds it up and he says, friends, you know. And the, the hippo thinks it's the cutest, the funniest thing in the world. And he's diffused it. And Tem Tembo thinks he's done something great. Until Butu is embarrassed by the entire thing. Everyone's laughing. And Tembo is heartbroken that his older brother, who he looks up to so badly, is disappointed in him. And this is where Butu kind of unleashes on him and says, look, you got to grow up. You know, all this kind of stuff. It was fine, but now that you're affecting me, you know, this isn't how the world works. You've got to fight. You've got to be tough. This is how the, the world is. The world is a tough place. And so later on, oh, and while they're at the watering hole, sorry, while they're at the watering hole, somebody spots a couple of men, humans, two-leggers, up on a ridge. And so they, they get, everybody gets spooked, and they take off. So we catch up with the herd later on under a full moon, and they're walking across the plains. And poor little Tembo is just heartbroken. And these other, these other little elephants about his age come up and start making fun of him, and they're laughing about what happened at the watering hole. And Tembo sees that his brother's watching. And so this is what I was talking about earlier, about you know you have that thematic, the theme where you can go against it, or you can go, or you can go with it, or you can go against it. Well, this is where Tembo sees, sees his brother. <clears throat> he sees his brother watching. He's let other little elephants are making fun of him. And he balls up his trunk and <clears throat> punches that little elephant right in the eye. And knocks the elephant down. And it gets and, he, and all of a sudden, a fight ensues. And Tembo doesn't know what to do. And he starts running. And he runs outside the herd to where he shouldn't be, to where it's not safe. And Butu has to chase after him and bring him back. And this is where we pick up. It was an accident! <gasps> Tempo! Butu! Tempo, get behind me! Hey, little guy. 
What are you doing way out here? Uh. Kijo, look! What is it, Kembo? Oh. Where are we? Watch where you're going. Hey, that's never gonna come out. Let's just stay Hey guys, look at me! I'm upside down! Wake up! Come, come on, Kijo! Oh no! Why are your ears so big? What? I don't know. I'm serious. Wake up! Did your bird die? Come on, Kijo! Oh great! Hi, I'm Timbo. I'm Zara. Temple, stand up straight and look tough. Why? It's the army. You want them to pick you. Hmm. <laughs> A big ear. This one will grow large. Hey, <laughs> A few years on the farm will toughen up that one. So, poor little Tembo. <laughs> so, poor little Tembo, who doesn't want to fight, ends up getting brought onto the farm, put on the wheel for years. He tries to escape, but he's constantly recaptured, brought back. Think of Conan on the wheel, turning the wheel. And that's his job until Tembo grows into this giant, giant elephant. And he's strong. And he does the work of all the rest of the elephants. All the rest of the elephants who are old and kind of haggard are just kind of sit back and watch everything go on. But we also realize very quickly that Tembo is still the sweet, innocent little guy that he was when he was little. As he's walking along, you see him pushing or pulling the, the mill, and all of a sudden he goes, oh, and he reaches down really gentle, and he picks up a little beetle that was in his way and puts it off to the side and continues on. Well, one day, Sarge, who we met at the marketplace, it's 15 years later, and Sarge is leading the army through the area, and Sarge comes across, he sees Tembo, and he goes, okay, this is the guy I want on my team. And so they come in. Now, keep in mind, just on a side note, there, humans are running the world, but we're telling it from the point of view of the elephants. And Sarge is kind of the voice of the humans, so in case people were wondering, because we had a lot of questions about that. 
But anyway, so Tembo is bought by the army, taken off the farm, and now he's, you know, he's this giant. And yes, I stole that layout from Jungle Book. <laughs> but, um, uh, but when it comes time for training, he's brought into you know, basic training. He's got to learn how to become a, a battle elephant. He's still sweet Tembo, and he doesn't want to fight. This is the last place he wants to be. He just wants to get home. That's all he's ever wanted to do. He wants to get home. He wants to see his mom again. He wants to see his brother again. So he's put into training, and he, he can't fight. He just runs away all the time. And so the sergeant gets really annoyed. He's, he's getting pretty pissed now. And so he takes Tembo, he takes him for a walk. He says, Tembo, follow me. Let's go for, let's, we're going to have a little talk. And he takes Tembo to the rock pit. And he says, this is where you're going to end up. This is where all the, the broken elephants, the elephants that can't fight anymore, the elephants that won't fight, this is where you're going to be if, you're not, if you don't fight. And Tembo's like, oh, what am I going to do? And so Tembo, that night, he decides he's going to escape. And he takes off. He leaves the barracks. He's, he's able to find a hole in the wall that Keech has found. Keech is with him. Keech kind of dissolves out of the story at this point. I'm just going to tell the story of Tembo, but Keech is there. And Tembo escapes. Well, the rest of the, the, rest of the guys in his, in his group, the, the other elephants, they see that he's, he's escaped. And they're like, we're going to get in trouble. It's sort of like, like stripes. See, we're going to get in trouble with this if we find out. You know, we've got to bring him back. So they all head out trying to find Tembo. Well, they go out into the jungle, and the enemy is out there trying to find the fort. And they come across the enemy, and the enemy captures all of Tembo's friends from, the, from, the, uh, from his company. And now he's faced, you know, what is he going to do? And their, their, their life is threatened. And so for the first time, something happens in Tembo. He feels there's a surge in him that he's never felt before, a rage that he's never felt before when he sees his friends threatened. And there's these really cool rope or vine bridges in India that actually exist from our research, we discovered. And so this battle ensues on the, on the, the vine bridge, and Tembo comes in and annihilates the, uh, the, the enemy elephants. He throws them all from the bridge. He's, an, he's an enraged, and he ends up the victor up on top of, of, this, of this rope bridge, or the vine bridge. Well... They, they make it back, and uh, nobody knows the difference, no, no, but the enemy is captured. They bring the enemy back, and Tembo is hailed as a hero. And it's the first time that he's ever had this kind of respect. And it, and it starts to, he's like, wow, this, this feels kind of good. And he said, you know, maybe, maybe this tough guy, you know, beating people up thing is kind of what I should be doing. And as a result, the sergeant makes him puts him out in, he, out, out, out in the lead because they have to go out. They're going to head out into the Himalayas and they're going to meet the enemy on their, on their own grounds. And so Tembo is set uh, out, taking up, leading the army out, and they leave the village and they head out across the huge landscape off into the Himalayas. As they cross the Himalayas, they get to the top and they can see the encampment of the, of the enemy down below. Tembo sees it. He looks back to everybody, they're all waiting, and he, he makes the call, charge! And they all go charging down the hillside into the, into the encampment. And Tembo's full of rage. He knows that he, you know, all he wants to do, he wants the respect, he wants, all the, you know, he wants that bloodlust he's starting to feel. And they go in and he's ripping through everybody. And as he's doing it, he, see, he picks out the biggest elephant on the enemy's side, and he knows if he can take that, that elephant, then they can, have the, they can win the battle. And so he picks them out, and they start battling. And they're going back and forth until he knocks the other elephant down. And when he does, the helmet on the other elephant falls off, and Tembo looks at him, and he sees the rip in his ear. And he's like, oh. he really, there's only one elephant that, that has that rip. And he knows it's Butu. Butu had been taken also and raised in another country, sold off in the market. Tembo is shocked and he, he, he backs up. He doesn't know what to say. And before he can say anything, 
He's kind of swept up. His, you know, the, the two sides come together. His men grab him. They pull him back. The other men, the other on the enemy side, they grab their, their wounded warrior and they pull back and the two sides separate. Well, as a result, Tembo doesn't know what to do. Now he sees what he's become and he doesn't know what to do. Well, a sergeant says, you know, they're, they're getting ready for battle the next day. They're going to go out and they're going to win this battle. And he says, I don't care who that other elephant is. You're going to get out there and you're going to do it. He says, Sergeant, I, I, if I can just tell him, if you just let me tell him who, who I am, then maybe we don't have to fight at all. Well, the sergeant doesn't want that. The sergeant wants the glory. He wants, the, you know, it's that, those are the, the world values. We're gonna, you know, they're going to be the toughest army. And so as a result, he straps the, the armor back on the tembo. He puts a bit in his mouth, <laughs> pulls it back and locks it in the place so he can't talk. He can't say anything. His, his, uh, his armor's strapped on and he's forced out. And the sergeant tells him, if you don't go out and fight, then I'm going to take out your, then your, your friends are going to fight and they're going to die. So Tembo's got no choice. And so he's forced out onto the battlefield and he faces off with his brother. Obviously his brother not knowing who he is. And his brother, who was embarrassed the day before, is determined to take out this elephant and win for his side. So a big battle ensues between the two. And Tembo won't fight. He doesn't want to hurt his brother. And his brother just keeps beating him down and beating him down and beating him down until Tembo ends up on the ground and he's got nothing left. And Butu... Who over uh, one of the other things that has happened to Butu is over time he's he's gotten so tough they've actually sawn off his tusks and replaced them with swords, which they actually did <laughs> through our research. And so um, so Tembo, who's laying on the ground and he's got nothing left, he can't speak. He's got the bit in his mouth. He can't pull the armor off because it's locked in place. Butu backs up and he backs up and he starts pawing the ground, starts pawing the ground, and he starts going at him with his head down, swords pointed forward, and he's, he's going to finish Tembo off until at the last second he pulls up short and Tembo holds up this little olive branch. There's only one elephant that's ever done that, that Butu has ever seen. And he, he comes to a stop. And poor Tembo He's, he, 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 you know, he's trying to speak. And Butu reaches down with his swords and slices the straps off. And the helmet comes off. And Tembo tells Butu who he is. And that, you know, and they reunite. The two of them come together. And they, he saves both sides. Butu basically says, hey, you know, we're fighting for the humans. What, is, you know, what, what are we doing here? And so both, both, all the elephants basically give up and decide to come together. <laughs> And it's peace and love everywhere. Yeah. But, um, but, um, but actually, Tembo and Butu, they lead the way, and they actually walk off the field, and Tembo and Butu actually make it home, and they reunite with their mother, and they live happily ever after. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> so um, I've got one, one last little treat. I think it was kind of cool. You know, before the studio, before the studio got shut down, um, uh, one of the other things that we do is we do a proof of concept, which is we'll take a little a little sequence and animate it. Um, and, it and it's our chance to kind of get the animator's feet wet, uh, modeling, rigging, environment, all that kind of stuff. It's our chance to kind of play out the way we want the movie to look, and we want to see how complex it's going to be to make it. And it's our way to develop the pipeline and all that. So this is a proof of concept test that we were working on when the studio shut down. We didn't get a chance to finish it, but the first shot, which is a very long shot, did get finished. So you'll get a sense of that. And then there's some nice little character things that happen throughout. You'll notice that the, the shots aren't done, but you'll at least get a sense of, of what it is.
So that was going to be our little teaser for uh, for the for the movie, but uh, but that's it. So that's that's kind of our story process, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, that's that. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Actually, I'm going to drink a little water. Uh, pencil. <laughs> Pencil, or you know, if I'm if I'm back in my office, I'm usually on a Cintiq, and I'll you know I'll do, I'll do my stuff in Photoshop. Uh, but when we're when we're in the story room, it's you know it's whatever we got handy, and we're always we're constantly you know it's a highlight mark marker. We're drawing with those. It's whatever we got. Yeah, yeah. If we had lipstick, we would draw with lipstick. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering how much of a mix between the two strategies you use. Or well, they're they're intertwined. So meaning, yes, the story should stand on its own. Are you talking about when it's so it's the one thing I can I can pitch to you that that can stand on its own. There's that, but as it develops, as we're figuring it out, it's going to change. It's going to it's going to evolve. It's going to morph, and so we just have to be willing to do that. But ultimately, when you get to the end of it and you've got that finished story that's going to be up on the screen in the same way that I just kind of pitched you Tembo. I could have pitched you Tembo without any of the visuals and you still would have gotten it. It helps to have the visuals. But that's, that's the note. That's the idea. You, you, know, you should be able to just let it stand on its own. But as you're making it, it's got to, you got to be willing to let things go and let it, let it go where it needs to go. Does that make sense? Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because of the process. Yeah. Do yeah. you think there's uh, any way live action films could improve by the process? You know, we've been talking about that for years and years and years, and I honestly don't know why they do it, why they don't do this process more, other than they just don't know. And I know that sounds really weird, but you'd be amazed at how outside the actual animation process the rest of Hollywood is, or, you know, feature film process. So many people in Hollywood think storyboarding is taking an action sequence and doing and doing animatics. That's not storyboarding. Not according to you know. It, storyboarding is what that clip that I played for you. We actually make the movie. You're seeing the acting. You're seeing the, we're put, putting dialogue and music and all of that. And it's not just action. It's two characters staring at each other. You know. And so why they don't do that, I don't know. Because one of the great things about one of the other benefits from a financial standpoint is. You know, we like to get the movie up three times before we ever start putting anything into production. Well, putting it up with a full, full, uh, uh, a full story crew, writer, two directors, producer, maybe uh, 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 visual development artists to start doing a little bit of uh, work here and there. We can get to that point for about $3 million on average. 
but live action, you know, live action people, they, they see that three million, they don't want to spend it because they don't know, they don't understand what they're getting out of it, at least from the people that I've talked to. But that spending that three million up front. And which is, you know, in Europe, they're making entire movies finished for $3 million. But when you're looking at a budget of $120 million and you spend $3 million to get it right, that's a really smart investment. And so why they don't do it, I really don't know. We've talked about it, like I said, we've talked about it for years and years and years. And I'm convinced you'd see a lot more great live action films if they did do it. Um, and I think some of the really great effects heavy uh, live action films that you do see, I, I do think they do a fair amount of storyboarding in there. So, anyway. Yeah. Um, so, in a, in a film, you have a pre production, and you have like the process, and you have uh, the method. I get still some films when you throw it on the big screen, and they end up failing. So yeah. Like, where do you think is like the greatest risk for like this film to just stop working when you have all this preparation, all this? You know, it's it's really hard to for me. It's hard to nail it down to any one thing. It could be bad timing. It could be a bad executive decision as far as not letting the story go where it needs to go. We've had that happen. Um, but all that being said, I do think really great animated films they don't fail. Even a film like Iron Giant, right? Everyone loves Iron Giant, right? And initially, that film failed in the box office, but it never died. And that film has got, it's what, how, 20 years later or whatever? I don't, I don't know how many years it's been. And it's still got legs, and people are still talking about it, and still people, people are still buying the DVD. And so initially, every great film will have its day. I'm a firm believer in it, if it's truly great. And I think Iron Giant's a perfect example of that. Yeah? A lot of times in either animation or games, there will be subject matter that are fairly removed from reality, either because of the setting, um, yeah. being a fantasy setting or something sci-fi. Um, right. How would you recommend going about research when there's no real clear correlation between what you want to portray and what's possible? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I, I think a good example of that from a live action standpoint is uh, whether or not you like the movie. I love the movies, but uh, Avatar, you know, Avatar, the amount of research that they put in, the amount of development they put in uh, is absolutely incredible. I mean, they created an entire world that they, they barely scratched the surface in in the actual first film. And the reason they do that is because they want it to be real. And so one of the things that John Lasseter used to have us do is he's a big believer in the same thing, you know, Bugs Life, uh, Cars, all of those are fantasy worlds. But the one thing he's great at, and Pixar is great at, and he tried to drill into us, is to find the parallels, find the things in our world that are parallel with that world. Sort of like in a Bugs Life, you walk into the garbage heap and it's a bar, right? And you got the flies eating, you know, eating the poo-poo platter and all that, you know. There's a lot of, and Cars is the same way. They're, they're they're so good at finding those parallels so that it doesn't feel so foreign, right? And it's, yes, it is fantasy, and yes, it is something you've never seen before, but at the same time, it kind of is something you're familiar with, and it, it grounds you in that reality. And that's the other thing, too, is, is create a reality and go with it and run with it and make it real to yourself. And if you can do that, then the, your audience will believe it. Yeah? Yeah. I was just wondering if you had tips on like how you use environment to better the story as well. Well, for me, it, it's it, it's just wrapped into the same process. So it's to me, environment is as important as character, right? Because it's your character has got to exist in an environment that is going to dictate what that character is going to do, whether it's you know going across the Himalayas and on on a grand scale, and somebody falls off a ledge and affects the story in some way or whatever. So it's hard to, for me, it's all one and the same. They all, you know, the environment is the story. The characters are the story. The environment is a character. You know, they're all interchangeable, you know, and it's just, they all kind of develop together. I know it's kind of a vague answer, but I, I don't know how to answer it other than that. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, I was really inspired by the 2D designs that you and your team made when you worked on Himbo. So 
so much so that I almost thought that until you showed that uh, little teaser that it was going to be like a 2D animated film. Yeah. Um, like, how are you able to like, uh, like, give, like, bring that visual idea, that, that 2D idea, and capture it? Or how were you able to capture it so well? Because the, I mean, the CGI, it looked really good. Like, you can still, the model of the boat was, like, it was captured very well. So how do we go from that flat 2D pencil drawn look to a final CG look? Is that kind of what you're asking? Um, well, one thing, <laughs> at the risk of sounding prideful, one thing I pride myself on is I try very, very hard, just because I've been on the other side as a crew member and had a director that didn't know what the hell they wanted and having to reiterate and iterate and iterate and iterate until you hit it, I really, really try hard to, to have a vision in my head of what I want a character to be or how I want a scene lit. And, and, I, and, and the great part of coming from an artistic stamp background is that I can then sit down and I can draw it out in the way that I'm thinking and I can show you instead of tell you. And so what that, what that does is it doesn't mean that I'm dictating to them what I want it to be. I'm just saying this is what I have in my head right now. What do you guys think? And that provides a jumping off point for everyone to go, oh, shit, I didn't know that's what you meant. Sorry. I didn't know it's, that's what you meant. And they go, oh, we can do it like this, or that looks really cool. Or, you know, this is the kind of lighting that I'm thinking about. It's about 4.30 in the afternoon, and the sun's dipping low, and I want, you know, particulate in the air. And there's, you know, we've all looked into the sun and, and seen the insects flying through the, you know, you can, you can portray that visually. And so being as clear as you can, clarity from a directing standpoint provides another thing that saves money is it, it, it knocks down the number of iterations. And so it's much easier to go from point A to B to C to D and get it out and, and have it come out the other side. So it, it really is about being clear in, in what you're and having really great artists, you know, and um, and trusting, trusting in the crew. That was another big one. You know, we, uh, there's so many directors that they, they want to micromanage. They, they feel that they have to, they've got to know it all. And that's not what a director, a director doesn't need to know it all. A director needs to steer the ship. The, you know, you've got, you've got a, you know, on Brother Bear, we had a crew of 360 people. There's 360 minds that can help make this movie. And so it's having, it's knowing when to use a particular idea and when not to, you know. And so that's kind of how we get there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? You know, I, this is, that's the eternal question from in our industry. There's actually uh, uh, Song of the Sea and some of those other films that were done in Europe. Song of the Sea was nominated for an Oscar. So they're out there. They're being seen and they're being... They're getting the accolades that they deserve. Uh, they don't have the budgets that I think they should have. I think Song of the Sea was made for like eight million bucks, and it's a it's a beautiful film, but it you know who knows what it could have been from an uh, from. Uh, I take that back because actually the story was really it's told really well, and I don't know that making it flashier would have made it better. So they did great. So I take all that back. But there there are. Um, I've been spoiled at Disney, <laughs> but there are uh, there are people out there that want to do it. I think the industry has to change, and I do. A lot of people disagree with me, but I do think the public there there was. Uh, I think we broke it a little bit during the Lion King days. We broke through the teenage crowd and the adult crowd, but I do think that there's uh, there's a prejudice that you know hand drawn cartoons. They're cartoons. They're Saturday morning, they're for kids. And it's hard to keep that going. But there's something about CG that takes it a step further, that makes it feel a little bit more real for the general audience where they it's not as kitty anymore. And they and they'll go and see it. So but I think all that's starting to wear off. And I think hand drawn is becoming a little bit more retro. And uh, I don't know that the big Disney hand-drawn musical will ever come back, but I do think that there's an opportunity down the road for the right budget, if we can find a way to, to do it. 
and uh, uh, and for the right look that will where the you can do a certain look uh, 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 an art direction that won't cost a lot of money. The bottom line is that you you want to get rid of the risk. Right now, doing a 2D film is too risky financially, because any any company that has the money to do it. You know, especially in the United States, if you pull together a crew, it's going to cost at least 50 to 60 million dollars to do it. And at the end of the day, this is a business and investors want return on their dollar. And, you know, if, if there's a risk of making a 2D film and it's going to be a flop, but I can do a 3D film and the chances are that it's going to make three times its budget. Well, then that's a no brainer. And that's the biggest thing holding it back, I think. I think I'm sorry. That's right. Point, right. We were talking about this the other day. Uh, Dragon's Last being made, I think, yeah. again, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. They're trying to do that, and Andreas is making his film, mm -hmm. I think, right? So right. there are people out there. Testing. There are. Yeah, I agree. But they're, if you talk to those guys, they're busting their ass trying to pull together the funds to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, you know, Dragon's Lair, they, they did it on, on uh, Kickstarter. Yeah. You know, they got it started, or, or GoFundMe, or something yeah, like yeah. that. So... The point being, there's no big studio stepping up and saying, "I'll fund you." Right. You know, they you gotta they want to they they want to get rid of the risk. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah. So what's the way that you keep yourself motivated to continue to do what you do, like drawing? Art I know. So many like things in life is happening. I love, love, love what I do. There's, oh, that's the only reason. I've had that question so many times. I've had so many people say, wow, I really love what you do, but I, I find it really hard to stay focused. Well, you just don't like, you don't love it enough. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you love it and you, and, and I, I wake up in the morning, I'm 48 years old and I still wake up in the morning. I can't wait to draw. I can't, I, I, I'm still a little kid. And so, and I love to tell stories. And I love to animate and I love to, you know, I like to jump all over the place. So I, I might run over and do an ink drawing and then I'll go animate something and then I'm going to go do an oil painting and then I do a Photoshop painting. I just can't, I, I love it. And so that's, that's my motivation is that, you know, I, I find myself, I think I'm one of the luckiest guys alive because I get to do this for a living. Uh, it's something that I truly, truly love that I can't believe. And I do it at home. I gotta pinch myself every day to, 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 you know. Of course, I love it. So that's that's my motivation. Yeah, yeah, right here. How? What are some places to start when you think you have an interesting story to tell, or mm -hmm. put some input into it, but you are not you're not necessarily great at translating that to other people. Um, right. It starts. What's that? Tra translating these stories that you have and you want to tell, and you think you can tell them well being able to tell them to other people and have them go, yeah. Yeah. Well, it starts with practice. But it, it really does, it, it, the more you, it's like anything. You want to be a great football player? What do you do? You play a lot of football. So it's like anything. You just do a lot of it, and you're going to get better at it. Uh, but I would start, you know, get around people you trust, your close friends, but people that are going to be honest with you. And, you know, pitch them the story. One of the, I have a good friend that was the head of our development. Her name is Pam Coates. And she said, a great storyteller can come in on a Monday and tell you what they did over the weekend and just have you on the edge of your seat. That's the kind of, that's, that's where you want to be. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So many, so often it's not the meat of the story. It's how it's told, you know? And so it's, it's really looking in, it's, it's exploring all those different avenues and, and just doing it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I've never done 3D. Okay. I tried to do Maya once, and I went, nope. <laughs> 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 so I love, no, don't get me wrong. I love 3D. I absolutely love it. I think it's an amazing medium, and I love to direct it because <laughs> I don't know how to do it. I, I love the possibilities of 3D. You know, it, it goes back to what I was talking about. You know, I love jumping over and doing a digital painting and then a water. I, you know, to me, 3D is another great medium. I love 2D just because I can do it. And I can sit at my desk and I don't need to plug this in and get this software and all that. All my software is in this little pencil I've got. And my, you know, my hardware is the, is, well, the software is here. Then the hardware is the paper and the pencil, right? And I just sit down and I can, I can make a story.
That to me, that's magic. That's that's so just absolute magic. Yes, I, I love the tactfulness of it. You know, it's I do feel like there's a, there's a there's a removal. You know, the artist the artist from the art a little bit in 3D. Um, but it's, I don't know. It, to me, it's it's the difference between you know a, a Rolls Royce that's made by hand. And I don't know what, what's an, a factory, a, a, a Ferrari. You know, I mean, well, maybe Ferraris are made by hand too. I don't know, but a, a really cool factory-made car. You know, they're they're neither one is better than the other. They're just different, and they're and they're both really cool. And they're, you know, I just said cool. They're both very emotionally awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you mind if I uh, give you a slightly alternative ending. Sure. I was going to say, since you use the sergeant so much as your villain, at the end, the sergeant needs to make an appearance. He does. He, <laughs> so I was going to say, when they come together and they fight, the sergeant with his other soldiers is going to ambush him from behind. And as they ambush him from behind, that's when he's got to let his uh, brother know that it's him. And just before he's going to get stomped out from above, then he waves him, waves him. And then they turn together and fight against the sergeant. It's so, you, 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 actually, it's like, that's exactly what we have in the movie. I just took the sergeant out. It's just the order is different. Yeah, the order is different. So what happens is they end up, they actually end up falling down a cliff and going and sliding out onto the ice. And as a result of that, a whole bunch of debris and everything comes down with them. And that's how the plants come out on the ice and Tembo's able to hold this thing up. But they're out on the ice and his brother comes at him, he holds it up and and they and the fight is diffused, and, and Boot, uh, uh, Sarge sees this, and he sees his chance for victory slipping away. So he goes out in a blind rage, and takes out as the two of them come together. He takes out Butu, and they're they're in a battle, and everyone's watching to see what's going to happen. And the ice breaks actually, and and the sergeant's trying to you know they're they're coming together, and and uh, and then once again it's going into symbolism, but uh, Butu. And, and the Sarge, they're covered in their armor and they're starting to sink and Tembo's trying to hold on to both of them and it's Butu that takes his armor off so he doesn't sink and pulls him out and the sergeant refuses to take his armor off and he sinks to the bottom and he's dead. So that's, it's just a lot more to pitch. So it's not, it's not the core of the story, so, but that's, that's, how that, that's how it happens in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in regards to storytelling, uh, what would your advice be on Say when you're pitching a story and you're trying to keep it original. Yeah. Like, you know, for a lot of current day movies coming out, you see, like, oh, it's just like this movie. Also. Yeah. Like, That'll happen 100% of the time. <laughs> it is. I mean, every, every story has been told. I'm a firm believer in it. Now, it, but think of it like music. You know, how many notes are there in music? There's 12. But look at, the, look at the spectrum you've got, right? So it's really just taking all the different elements and, and arranging them in a way that's unique, that hasn't been seen before. And, and remembering that. And one of the things you can do that is every, every person here has a unique life history, right? So if you can pour more of yourself into it and really dig deep, the uniqueness of that story will, will come more to the surface, I think. And be honest. I mean, really be true to yourself. Be true to the story. Yeah. Yeah. I guess feeding into that, again, how do you find, like, your themes? These themes are such an important foundation. Yeah. And I assume it's drawn from your life you don't. Yeah, it really, it, it start, at a certain point it does click. But one of the things we, we, we always talked about our story meetings being therapy sessions too. Because you got to be honest, right? And it really is like sitting down with a shrink and you got to sit down and you're like, <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times, you know, we got grown men sitting in the story room and we're crying and my brother did this to me and he fucking spit on me. You know, and it, it was, and it, it, but it, it makes it real, you know? And out of that, you'll say, well, what is, what is that about? What are we trying to say here? And we will sit for eight hours, 16 hours, 24 hours, three days, saying, trying to nail what that theme is. And we'll boil it down and boil it down. Okay, I think this is what we're trying to say. You know, Brother Bear, for a long time, after it became a brother story, we really, we had kind of the story, but we didn't know what it was about. And ultimately, it became, you know, you need to walk a mile in another's shoes to truly understand them. 
And it wasn't until 9-11 happened. And 9-11 happened. And I remember watching the news and seeing all these Muslim people here in the United States being persecuted for something they didn't do. And that really struck a chord with me. And then I started, and that's where I went, that, what's happening right there, what I'm seeing, that's exactly what this movie is. And so I brought that back in, we brought that, and we talked about it, and we started molding the story around that. Here, you, know, you have Kenai, whose brother was killed by a bear, and he wants to kill all bears, he hates them all. And so it's the same story, it's just told, you know, it's told in a different direction. And so it's, you know, you don't, sometimes it'll just pop up, and other times you really got to fight to, to, to get it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it, the the visuals go through the same number of iterations as the story does. So, like you saw that those pictures of Kicha when I had Aziz Ansari up there, he was just a skin, he was just a caricatured skinny little oxpecker. And it's not until I like saying that oxpecker, but it's 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 not until the story developed and we really kind of started figuring out the the traits that his look really started to become more and more solid. And that's when he got fat and that's when he, you know, his wings got smaller and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So uh, it just takes time. Yeah. Uh, what kind of, so you seem to have done like a lot of environments like outside, right? Mm -hmm. what, what are some other environments you've touched on and how do you, what are, um, what are some of the environments you've worked on and touched on and how are you eliciting emotions from, say, outside versus in a room? Do you have to be an artist to do that? That's like three questions. I'm not sure I'm following your question. So, um, you, said, you said the creation of the environment is just as important. Yeah, well, it dictates, as, as, you're, as you're telling a story, the environment, your character has to be in an environment. But an environment might be a room, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, so it's... To me, it's it's whatever. What story do you want to tell? I think I'm, I hope, I'm I think I'm going down the road that you're looking for. It's what story you're going to tell, and figuring out what's the best place to tell it. You know, what's the best character you, to 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 tell it? What's you know, like I said, it all kind of goes together. They're all intertwined. They're all mortared together. You can't break them apart. And so there is a best place to tell it, and there is a best character to to. to to act in it, you just have to find it. Does that make sense? Did I tell it? Did I answer it? Uh, there's a best way to tell it, and there's a best place to tell it. Yeah, and it's really just, you, but you have to really understand the story that you're trying to tell. You know, obviously this this story we felt like okay, we you know we that's the whole reason we set it in the time period we did during the time of Hannibal and Alexander because you know that's the type of you know this little little boy that's ripped from his world. And has to is forced into you know this epic battle you know that we felt like okay this is the best environment plus it's 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 a place that we've never seen before in animation you know so there's there's a lot of elements like that that we ask ourselves you know have we seen this before does it feel unique is this is this the best way to tell this thematic this story all that kind of stuff I'm kind of rambling a little bit but I think I think that's the answer you're looking for yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know when to have, say, the boldness or confidence to tell your director? Or you know, that really is up to the director. We always, always, always had an open door policy. So we, our crew was, and I always drilled that in, you know, and I always made sure, like, if we did a screening, and you guys remember this, anytime directors would come in and do give a screening, you know, they would always ask for notes. And um, if I'm if I'm at work late at night, and I'm boarding something and I've got something finished and I'm looking at it, you know, sometimes the custodian would come in and he's emptying the garbage cans and I'd sit him down and, and I'd pitch it to him and ask him what he thought. Because that's those, that's our, our audience, right? That's fresh eyes. So it's just, it really comes from how comfortable the director or the leaders of the studio make the crew feel. So that's on them. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm actually kind of like studying animation both from the 2D and 3D perspectives. And I was curious, like, 
um, how well you kind of like go about boarding these kind of like scenes and like then developing them into like getting those like blocks um, on the in betweens and everything. I'm like, how how do I go from boards to animation? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like or you know like really kind of like focusing I guess on the performance because mm -hmm. you really want to like have a good performance at the end. And, right. Yeah. Right. Well, once again, uh, it goes back to the story and how interesting is it, how every story needs conflict, right? Every scene needs conflict. Um, if you don't have conflict, even in a shot or, or in a sequence, if you don't have conflict, there's no reason for it to be there. And a lot of people will argue that, well, what about comedy? You know, it's, if, you, if you break down every sequence in a film, there's always conflict. You're always shifting from a positive to a negative or a negative to a positive. And if you're doing that well, then you've got something to to perform, right? So there's your first step. So you got you got a performance there now. So now you need now the next step. It's you know I, I always think of it incrementally. So the next step now is okay. How am I going to perform it? You know what's the best way to do? It? Well, there's there might you know maybe there's my way. I'll start with my way. This is how I would act it out. But maybe that's how everybody would act it out, and not maybe not specifically this character. So then it's about getting into that character's head that you've been developing for the last year or whatever. And so then it, then it comes to, well, how well do you know your character? So it, it becomes kind of this Pandora's box that once you get into it, it, it you know, but it really is, there's a whole bunch of different elements that will make those sequences unique and make the performances entertaining. But it really has to start with getting some good conflict in there. That and, and that sequence has to belong in that story, you know. And then, and then just take it from there one, one step at a time until it comes out the other end. An acted out scene, you know? Okay. All right. Good. <laughs> Thank you, guys.